Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. I'm Jeff Ross. I'm one of the associate pastors here at Roswell United Methodist Church, and I'm glad that you've tuned in for this time of worship. Our scripture passage today comes from John's Gospel, the 12th chapter, verses 1 through 8. Now, six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of the disciples... Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't the perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did this because he cared about the poor, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she would save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this day, for your word, and pray your blessing on this time of uh, worship that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts might be acceptable to you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, Jesus is anointed. And this is a, a passage that's uh, kind of interesting. So I, I, I want to ask you a question uh, as we begin. Did this anointing of Jesus happen one time during his ministry, two times during his ministry, or three times? What's recorded in the Gospels? One event, two events, or three events? It's recorded in each of the Gospels, but is it recording the same event or different events? Well, let's take a look and, and you can decide. In John's gospel that we just read, it says that it happened six days before the Passover at Lazarus's house, who was a friend, in Bethany. Mary, the sister of Lazarus, the sister of Martha, of Martha and Mary fame, uh, does the anointing. She anoints Jesus' feet, and Judas... One of the disciples is the one who complains about it. Jesus says the purpose is that this perfume be saved to anoint him for his burial. 
So it's a, 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 a burial image action motif. So let's move to Luke. Luke chapter 7 is where this event takes place uh, in Luke's gospel, which is a long time before Passover. It's not during Passover at all. It's early in Jesus's ministry. That event happens at the home of a Pharisee. The person that is identified as the one who does the anointing is simply called a sinner. This sinner anoints Jesus' feet, and it's a Pharisee that complains. At the very end of this story, Jesus sums up the, the purpose and says, Your faith has saved you, speaking to the sinner, go in peace. Now, Matthew and Mark tell almost a identical story, but it happens two days before the Passover, not six and not early on in Jesus' ministry. The house is identified as Simon the leper, who is not a Pharisee and is not kin to Lazarus. The, a woman is identified as the one who does the anointing, but the woman is not named. She, in, in Matthew and Mark, it's Jesus' head that is anointed and not his feet. In Matthew, it's the disciples who complain about the waste. In Mark, it just says some people that were there complained about the cost and how the money could have been used. And it states that the purpose of the anointing two days before the Passover was to prepare Jesus for burial. So, I want to ask you again, do you think it was one event that was just spun in different ways? Do you think it was two events? Uh, do you think it was three events? Did it happen early in Jesus' ministry and then two days before the Passover and six days before the Passover? Um, Christian scholars are sort of divided over this, so don't feel alone. It doesn't really matter how many times it happened, it's still awkward, as you can see from this picture. But Jesus, <laughs> he doesn't act like it's awkward, which is fascinating to me. He doesn't act like it's awkward. He doesn't get flustered. He doesn't lose his train of thought. He leans right into this like it's perfectly okay and natural. He embraces what's going on. He is even very forceful in his defense of those who are anointing him. He comes to their defense. Now, if this had happened to you at a party or an event, uh, a lot of people gathered, somebody comes in and starts pouring oil on your feet or on your head, wouldn't you feel awkward? Wouldn't that be one of the most awkward things that you could imagine? Compare this story in John 12 with the very next chapter, John 13. In John 13, the story opens with Jesus anointing the disciples' feet uh, at, at the supper, the Passover supper, or the Monday Thursday supper. Uh, Jesus anoints the, or, or washes the disciples' feet. Um, and they feel incredibly awkward. They complain. They don't like it. They want Jesus to stop. They resist because it is and would be for you and me so awkward. So why, why the difference? What's going on with Jesus that is not going on with the disciples and via the disciples, you and me? Well, what, what would be awkward? What are those instances in your life that are awkward? Uh, I did a Google search, and uh, some of the things that came up are accidentally ending a work call by saying, okay, I love you, like you're talking to your spouse and you forgot you were talking to your boss. Um, 
complaining about somebody and their behavior and then realizing that they're right behind you the whole time. Forgetting a friend's birthday is awkward. Waving at somebody and going, hey, Charlie, how are you? Oh, you're, you're not Charlie, sorry. That, that's awkward. Spilling coffee on your white shirt or blouse on your way to work uh, is awkward. Um, texting the wrong person. Hey, I look forward to getting together. Uh, can we meet at 8 o'clock? Uh, I'd love to see you. Uh-oh, that was not who I intended to send that to. Uh, the, another one was, uh, and I've done this, maybe you've done it too, bumping into a mannequin at the store, not looking at where you're going, bumping into the mannequin and saying, oh, excuse, oh, sorry, you're just a mannequin. Lots of things are awkward. So what is Jesus doing? Jesus doesn't seem to get all weirded out about this encounter. He allows the person to continue what they're doing, almost inviting it, relaxing, uh, continuing to talk to people as this is happening, especially in the Luke version, and then defending the person who anointed him after criticisms arise about this event. Jesus is kind. <laughs> He's gracious. He's honored. And, th and that's really hard to grasp because it's a lot. It's a lot of perfume. It's a lot of money. His detractors say to Jesus, this is wasteful. Wasteful. If this happened two or three times, like some folks claim that it did, then what would have been awkward were, would have been the people gathered there going, oh my gosh, is this happening again? Um, but either way, Jesus is not put off by it. He's embracing it. And I wonder how you feel when you're put on the spot. Is there ever not awkwardness in those times? At a retirement dinner, maybe you've experienced that, or a retirement event, you, you feel a little shy about being called out or honored or celebrated. At your 50th anniversary, it's fun to have friends and things there, but it is a little awkward uh, to receive all of those accolades and be the center of attention. At your 40th birthday, at your 18th birthday, uh, whenever you might receive an award. And oftentimes the struggle that we feel is that we don't feel worthy. We don't uh, feel like we measure up. We're uncertain. Uh, we feel less than. Uh, and people are honoring us, but our head oftentimes in those moments goes to the things we don't do well and, and we, we often lack the ability to celebrate with people uh, when things go well. We're, we often lack the ability to celebrate with ourselves when things go well. In fact, some folks, that's a particularly vulnerable time to do something self-destructive because we don't feel like we measure up. Or even worse, we feel shameful, we feel ugly, we feel unworthy. I love the writer Brene Brown. She's done so much to help bring out this idea of shame and vulnerability and, and how it impacts us and how it uh, uh, creates uh, so much dysfunction in our lives and those around us and how we might move through shame and vulnerability to embrace who we are and things that are happening and to celebrate more. Brene Brown says, shame is the warm feeling that washes over us, making us feel small and flawed 
and never good enough. She says, shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and unworthy of belonging. So, so here's the thing. Life is hard, but we make it so much harder by the voices that we listen to and what we allow ourselves to think and feel about those voices. We hear on one side from the Bible and from church and from God and from folks that we are created in God's image and that the creation is good. We hear the words of John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. We hear the words of 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sin, he, God, is faithful and just and will forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. <laughs> Those are great promises, great words. The problem is we have such a hard time leaning into that. We have such a hard time believing those words are for us. We have such a hard time accepting who we are because we have these nagging thoughts about things we've left undone and unsaid. We know these promises are from God, but are they for us, really? For us? Or are they for someone else who's done better, lived better, acted better? It's so hard to move knowledge from our head to our heart. And Jesus knows this. He knows that life is awkward for us. And so it's interesting that we see in this story, in this scene, that Jesus doesn't act into that awkwardness because it's not awkward for him. Jesus knows God. Jesus knows God's love. Jesus is living fully in the reality of God's love. The, they're joined together in such an intimate way. Jesus knows the goodness of God. Jesus knows that God is on his side. God is not waiting for Jesus to mess up so God can punish him. Jesus knows that. He celebrates that. He lives in that joy from day to day. So he's happy to receive this blessing. He's happy to experience this grace of God. Last Sunday, uh, Dr. Davis talked about the prodigal son, and that's, uh, or, and that's such a great illustration for this. The prodigal son was in a far land feeling shameful, feeling like a failure. Uh, he was defining himself by all the mistakes that he made. He couldn't see himself in any other way. He finally resolves to go back to his father. He says, I'll be a servant. I'm sorry for who I am and what I've done. He feels this intense shame of all that he's done. And when he comes home, the father sees him from a distance, runs, embraces him, loves him, welcomes him back into the family. Now, it's hard to receive that sort of grace, isn't it? It's hard to receive that because our self-image is often tainted uh, by voices in our head and in our hearts that we can't let go of. I hope, two weeks away from Easter, I hope that Easter is a time as you begin to prepare and reflect on Easter. I pray that Easter is a time where you can reflect on what Jesus has done for you and for me out of love for us. It's not out of anger. It's not out of spite. It's not out of revenge or retaliation. When Jesus is hanging on the cross, he's not cursing humanity at all. Jesus' gift to you and me is out of love, and it's presented as a gift. And the thing about gifts 
is that they sit on the table unopened, unused, and unappreciated until we pick them up and embrace it. And I pray that as we get closer to Easter in these next two weeks, that you'll embrace this gift. You'll see yourself through the eyes of God the Father who loves you, who thinks you are great, and wants to guide you and help you live into his best for you. Let us pray. Gracious God, we struggle. We struggle with things that have been said to us. We struggle with images all around us where uh, people that are successful and have it all together don't look just like us. We're, we're shorter or uh, have a different color hairstyle or don't dress as well or don't live in the right places or uh, whatever the list goes on and on and on. We see ourselves oftentimes, God, as lacking. And I pray, God, that you would guide us to see and embrace and celebrate your love. That as you speak into our lives and hearts, it won't be awkward. It won't be awkward to receive blessings. It won't be awkward to receive your good news and good words on our behalf. It won't be awkward to believe, fully believe, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. And that because of that, we have this power. We have this new life. We have this ability now to walk in grace and strength and not be slaves to sin and death. Guide us, God, as we go from here. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. Thank you for joining us. My name is Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image. And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, he made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.